It was faster than the F-22, stealthier too, nearly invisible to radar, Mach 1.6 without even using afterburners, two prototypes built, millions spent, and then the Air Force said no. But here's what keeps defense experts awake at night. They might have rejected the wrong plane. The YF-23 Black Widow 2 sits in museums now, but its ghost haunts every Pentagon meeting about the next generation of fighters. What if America's most advanced stealth fighter never flew a combat mission because of a decision that had nothing to do with performance? The story of the Black Widow 2 isn't just about a plane that lost a competition. It's about what happens when the best technology meets politics, budget cuts, and a military culture that couldn't let go of dogfighting. And 35 years later, the consequences of that choice are becoming impossible to ignore. Welcome to Jet Insight, where we bring you the untold stories of military aviation that shaped our nation's defense. The YF-23 Black Widow 2 represents one of the most controversial decisions in Air Force history. If you think America should always choose the best technology over politics, type best tech wins in the comments below. The Cold War Challenge Let's go back to the 1980s. The Cold War was reaching its peak, and American intelligence had a problem. Soviet satellites revealed something alarming. The Russians were building two new fighters that could challenge everything America had in the skies. The Su-27 and MiG-29 weren't just improvements. They were game changers, fast, maneuverable, and equipped with technology that threatened to make the F-15 Eagle obsolete. The Air Force knew they needed a replacement, and they needed it fast. But this wasn't going to be just another fighter jet. This had to be revolutionary. The program was called the Advanced Tactical Fighter Competition, and it would become one of the most expensive military contracts in history. We're talking about $100 billion on the line. Multiple companies submitted proposals, but the Air Force narrowed it down to two finalists in 1986. Lockheed teamed up with Boeing and General Dynamics to build the YF-22 Lightning II. Northrop partnered with McDonnell Douglas to create the YF-23. Both teams received $691 million to build their prototypes. That's over $1.7 billion in today's money. Each team also invested hundreds of millions of their own funds. The stakes couldn't have been higher. The requirements were brutal. The new fighter had to be stealthy enough to penetrate Soviet air defenses. It needed to cruise at supersonic speeds without afterburners, something called supercruise that would save fuel and reduce heat signatures. It had to carry weapons internally to maintain its stealth profile, and it still needed to outmaneuver anything the Soviets could put in the air. Many engineers thought it was impossible to achieve all of this in one aircraft. Northrop had an advantage, though. They'd been working on stealth technology for years. The B-2 Spirit Bomber was their creation, and they learned how to make curved surfaces disappear from radar. This wasn't like Lockheed's F-117 Nighthawk with its sharp, faceted design. Northrop knew how to blend form and function in ways that looked almost alien. Before we dive deeper into what made the Black Widow 2 so special, please take a second to like this video and subscribe. Over 98% of viewers watch without subscribing. It costs you nothing, but it means a lot to us. Your support helps us bring more stories about the incredible machines that keep America safe. The Black Widow takes shape. The YF-23 wasn't just another fighter jet design. It was radical, diamond-shaped wings that looked like they belonged on a spacecraft, a V-tail configuration that defied conventional wisdom, engine exhausts hidden in troughs that scattered infrared signatures. Every curve, every angle, was calculated to minimize radar reflection. The result was an aircraft that looked like it came from the future. Two prototypes were built. PAV-1, painted charcoal gray, and nicknamed Gray Ghost, was powered by Pratt and Whitney YF-119 engines. PAV-2, painted in two shades of gray and called Spider, used General Electric YF-120 engines. Both versions were testing different engine technologies to see which would be superior. On August 27, 1990, test pilot Paul Metz took the Grey Ghost into the sky for its maiden flight, 50 minutes of pure performance. The aircraft handled beautifully, responding to every input with precision. Two months later, on October 26, Jim Sandberg flew the Spider for the first time. Both prototypes exceeded expectations. The numbers tell the story. The YF-23 measured just over 67 feet long with a wingspan of 43 feet. Top speed, 
Mach 2.2 at altitude. But here's the impressive part. It could supercruise at Mach 1.6 without afterburners. The Pratt & Whitney version hit Mach 1.43 in supercruise, while the General Electric version reached Mach 1.6. Both were faster than the YF-22's Mach 1.58. Range was another strength. The Black Widow 2 could fly nearly 3,000 miles, with a combat radius of 800 miles. Its service ceiling reached 65,000 feet, higher than most threats could reach, and its stealth characteristics were reportedly superior to the competition. The radar cross-section was so small that one engineer claimed it was nearly 100% undetectable by radar systems of that era. But here's where things get interesting. The YF-23 sacrificed one thing for all these advantages. Extreme maneuverability at low speeds. It didn't have thrust vectoring nozzles like the YF-22. It couldn't perform those dramatic post-stall maneuvers that looked so impressive in demonstrations. The Northrop team believed that future air combat would happen at long range, beyond visual distance, where stealth and speed mattered more than dogfighting ability. The competition heats up. Now we come to the heart of the story, and this is where it gets controversial. Both teams had to demonstrate their aircraft to the Air Force, but they took very different approaches, and this difference would determine the winner. Lockheed went for spectacle. They pushed the YF-22 to its limits, showing off aggressive high angle of attack maneuvers that seemed to defy physics. The plane could point its nose almost straight up while still flying forward. They fired test missiles, an AIM-9 Sidewinder and an AIM-120, AM, RAAM, proving the weapons bay worked perfectly. Every demonstration was designed to impress, to show fighter pilots that this was a machine they could really fight with. Northrop took a different path. They were engineers first, and they approached the demonstration like a scientific experiment. Their goal was to validate their design predictions and gather clean data. The demonstrations were technically successful, hitting every target number. But they didn't fire any missiles. They didn't push the envelope on low-speed maneuvering. They played it safe. In hindsight, this was a critical mistake. The Air Force wasn't just buying data points. They were buying confidence. The YF-22's flashy performance offered tangible proof of combat potential. The YF-23's conservative approach, while scientifically sound, didn't create the same emotional impact. There were other factors at play, too. Lockheed had a stellar reputation for managing complex classified programs. They'd built the F-117 Nighthawk stealth fighter, and despite its quirky appearance, it had performed flawlessly in combat. Northrop, meanwhile, was dealing with cost overruns and political challenges on the B-2 bomber program. Fair or not, this created doubts about their ability to manage another massive project. Then there's the factor nobody likes to talk about openly, industrial base politics. By 1991, Lockheed Martin's fighter division was in trouble. They didn't have any new fighter programs in the pipeline. If they lost the ATF competition, they might exit the fighter business entirely. Some analysts believe this tipped the scales. On April 23, 1991, Secretary of the Air Force Donald Rice made the announcement. The YF-22 had won. It would become the F-22 Raptor. For the Northrop team, it was devastating. What might have been? The consequences of that decision are still playing out today. The F-22 Raptor became one of the most capable fighters ever built. No question about it, but it also became one of the most expensive and troubled programs in Air Force history. The original plan called for 750 aircraft. Only 187 were built before production ended in 2011. Cost overruns, technical challenges, and changing priorities killed the program early. Now imagine if the YF-23 had won instead. Would it have faced the same problems? Recent analysis suggests it might have had some advantages. The Black Widow 2's design was actually simpler in some ways. No thrust vectoring meant fewer complex parts to maintain. The emphasis on stealth and range aligned better with how air combat actually evolved in the 21st century. Think about every air war since 1991. Desert Storm, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. How many involved close-range dogfights? Almost none. Nearly every engagement happened at beyond visual range, exactly the scenario the YF-23 was optimized for. Modern air combat is about seeing the enemy first, shooting first, and never getting close enough for a turning fight. Stealth and supercruise matter far more than post-stall maneuvers. 
Some defense experts now argue that the YF-23 was simply ahead of its time. It was designed for the warfare of 2020, not 1990. Fighter pilots in 1991 still valued extreme maneuverability because that's what had won fights in Vietnam and the Middle East. But by the time the F-22 entered service in 2005, the world had changed. Advanced sensors and missiles meant traditional dogfighting was becoming obsolete. There's another intriguing possibility. If Northrop had won, the entire defense industrial base might have evolved differently. Instead of Lockheed Martin dominating fighter production, we'd have had more competition, more innovation, potentially lower costs. We've built an incredible community of military veterans and aviation enthusiasts who discuss these topics in depth. Join us in the comments where real conversations about military technology happen every day. The Ghost Returns But the YF-23 story doesn't end with its loss in 1991. After the competition, both prototypes were transferred to NASA for potential research programs. Those programs never materialized. The aircraft sat in storage for years. In 1996, they were finally sent to museums. PAV-1, the Gray Ghost, went to the National Museum of the United States Air Force in Dayton, Ohio. PAV-2, the Spider, ended up at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance, California. For most people, that's where the story ended. Two museum pieces, reminders of what might have been. But in the world of defense contractors and military planners, the Black Widow 2 never really died. In 2004, Northrop briefly reclaimed PIV-2 from the museum to use as a display model for a proposed regional bomber based on the YF-23 design. That project didn't happen, and the prototype returned to the museum. But it showed that Northrop still believed in the basic design concept. Then in 2018, rumors started circulating that Northrop might offer a modernized version of the YF-23 to Japan for their next fighter program. Japan was looking to replace their aging F-2 fighters and wanted something more advanced than what was currently available. Ultimately, Japan decided to develop their own sixth-generation fighter in partnership with the UK and Italy. But the fact that the YF-23 was even considered, nearly 30 years after it lost the competition, says something significant. Now, in 2025, the Ghost is back again, and this time it might actually fly. The Navy is developing the F-A-20, their next carrier-based fighter. In August, Northrop Grumman released concept art for their F-A-20 proposal. And guess what it looks like? The YF-23. Those distinctive diamond wings, the V-tail configuration, the blended fuselage. It's all there, evolved and modernized, but clearly descended from the Black Widow 2. This isn't just nostalgia. Northrop is making a statement. They're saying the design philosophy that lost in 1991 was actually correct all along. Emphasis on stealth over maneuverability long range over close in fighting. Everything that made the YF-23 too radical in 1990 is exactly what makes sense for sixth generation fighters today. There's a bitter irony here though. The F-A-20 program is in serious trouble. The Pentagon wants to cancel or delay it due to budget constraints. Congress wants to keep it alive. It's the same political battle that killed early production of the F-22. History doesn't repeat. But it sure does rhyme. The lasting questions. So why does the YF-23 still haunt the Air Force? It's not just about one airplane that lost a competition. It's about deeper questions that America still hasn't answered. First, there's the question of how we make procurement decisions. Should technical superiority win? Or should we factor in industrial base concerns, program risk, and political considerations? The YF-23 was arguably the better aircraft for the mission. But the YF-22 came from a contractor with a stronger track record and better political connections. Second, there's the question of military culture. Fighter pilots grew up idolizing dogfighting aces. That culture influenced the decision to choose the more maneuverable YF-22. But modern warfare has made traditional dogfighting almost obsolete. Should pilot preferences override technical analysis about how future wars will actually be fought? Third, there's the question of program management. Both the F-22 and F-35 faced faced massive cost overruns and delays. The planned fleet of 750 F-22s became 187. The F-35 is years behind schedule and billions over budget. Would the F-23 have done better? We'll never know. But it's worth asking whether the problem is specific designs 
or the entire procurement system. And finally, there's the question of strategic vision. The YF-23 was designed for a specific type of warfare, long-range, stealthy, efficient. That's exactly the warfare America faces against peer competitors like China today. Vast distances in the Pacific, advanced air defenses, the need to penetrate deep into enemy territory and return safely. The Black Widow. Two was built for this mission 35 years ago. Recent articles about the YF-23 aren't just nostalgic. They're asking hard questions about American defense priorities. One analysis argued that even if the YF-23 had won, it would have failed because the political and military establishment lacked the discipline to support either design properly. The real failure wasn't choosing the wrong jet. It was that America's system for developing and producing advanced fighters was already broken. These questions matter because America is making the same decisions right now about the next generation of fighters. The NGAD program, the FA-20, and other advanced projects are all facing the same pressures that affected the ATF competition. Budget constraints, industrial base concerns, technical risk, and competing visions of future warfare. Conclusion The YF-23 Black Widow Two sits in two museums today, one in Ohio and one in California. Beautiful aircraft with those distinctive diamond wings and canted tails, yet they never flew in combat. They remain what-ifs, examples of brilliant engineering that never got its chance. But the ghost might finally get its vindication. If Northrop's FA-20 design wins, the Black Widow returns 35 years later. Our brave men and women in uniform deserve the absolute best technology America can build. What matters is making the right choice this time. If this story fascinated you, hit that like button and subscribe for more untold stories of American military aviation. Understanding yesterday's decisions helps us make better choices tomorrow.